Okay, excellent. Okay, let's get started on today's class now. Okay, good. Now, let me do. Okay, so today we will discuss about uh, uh, the material beyond beyond the, the the diffusion, and then we will explain the diffusion equation further. Okay, and uh, they they will not be limited to a diffusion, and also we will complete the discussion on the fax method. Okay, before that, a few logistics I want to update to you so that all of us will know the plan in the following a few a few weeks. Okay, so firstly, the homework three uploaded, so you can work on that, and then for the midterm exam exam number two that is coming now. That is coming, and the, the, this exam is so far I have received the uh, uh, eight groups as we show in the previous uh, lecture. Eight groups, okay, and then we will do four groups on each day, and then you will make the presentation. And uh, I received the 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 description, one page description summary of the projects from quite a few of them. That's great. I will reply to you with my comments one by one. Okay, so. Hold on there. If I don't reply to you before that, that then remind me. But I definitely can can finish all careful reading of all the all the file you sent to me, and then give you the feedback before the exam. So so you should be okay. Okay. And then during the presentation, all the students make sure ask questions, criticize your colleagues' uh, proposed project, because uh, through the through the intensive intellectual discussion and exploration, then we can make uh, make some new finding, new discovery, and then can help the speaker, can help your colleagues to refine, improve their projects, okay? So I do encourage all of you to criticize with a sharp mind on, the, on, the, on all the projects, both your projects and your colleagues' projects, okay? And then after the presentation, each group, after the presentation, you can revise the proposal and your PPT based on the comments you received, based on your suggestion you received, okay? And then send that to me. Each group just send me one. You can CC your group members. So I expect eight emails containing the proposal and the PPT, okay? I have the ex excellent examples uploaded in the Canvas. So feel free to use that. If you need more, I have more. Actually, there are many, many excellent examples um, presented by previous students. Very good job, very, very good. Okay, so I picked up some of them, in put them on a, in a canvas. I think that will be will be enough to give you some sense, give you some good uh, um, examples. Okay, but if you need more, you can let me know. Okay, so and then the the score for your exam number two will be based on your presentation, and uh, uh, we will we will judge. Based on the unique uniqueness, importance of your project, and how how good you package the ideas and the background significance together into our presentation, that within ten to twelve minutes we are we can receive the the positive message from you that we we can be convinced by your talk that indeed the project that you proposed is a very very important project and you have. Propose the new biophysical ideas to quantitatively perform this project, and then we expect you to get a get a nice results. Okay, so then we will give you the score. Okay, I I think the score of course some of you think the scores are important, but I I think more important is this chance, the opportunity for you to practice. Okay, after you become become uh, faculty members or leaders in the future in the university or in the national lab. You will always need this skill to present your research. So it's a right now. It's a, it's a good to prepare this and cultivate this skill earlier. Okay. So take advantage of this opportunity, and then we look forward to eight excellent presentations in the following two lectures. Okay. Do you guys hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Excellent, excellent. We look forward to the lectures. Okay, yeah. Okay, and feel free to email me your um, your improved description or your slides even before the exam. That's fine. I can comment for you. 
even you even I have a command already for you, it's also fine to send me back the updated version. Okay, I can do it multiple times, not necessarily just one time. Okay, so we can do it iteratively so that your project can be improved much, uh, much better. Okay, okay, so other updates, other, other logistical updates, including that, uh, that uh, besides in the following lectures, besides two invited talk that uh, right after the midterm exam number two, then in that on that week, that is uh, uh, November. Third no, November, November third week, I think it's November six, November six week. That week, we will, uh, we, I will record one lecture because in that week, in that week, three, we have three lectures. One will be the invited lecture. Another one, another two. One will be, uh, I will record a lecture. Put on, put the video on the Zoom so then you can watch because uh, I have a invited talk in in the Washington, so I will not be here. So you can watch that uh, lecture during the during the day, during that lecture. Okay, and then the last uh, last day, that Friday. This should be Wednesday. I think this is Wednesday. So Friday, we will have, have no class. That's because the veteran holiday, holiday. So that we don't have class. Okay. So that takes care of uh, that uh, that week. After that week, we will resume. We will start come back to the Zoom to start our class, and we have a uh, we have a uh, very really, very really exciting. Um, Microscope uh, lectures, uh, optics lectures, biophysical object, optics lectures, and uh, the the polymer composite, uh, the the polymer biophysics lectures, and uh, some other new new uh, biophysics topics to be covered in the remaining remaining of remaining time of the semester. Okay. Okay, and I will I will put the um, PowerPoint slides on the canvas so you can preview the material before the class, okay? Okay, last but not least, that uh, many of you actually send me survey uh, those days. That's uh, that's really good, that's really great. And the, the from the from those the survey, I see that you guys are learning very well. So I saw very positive comments. So that's great, that's very really encouraging. So I, I hope the class can help all of you and also help future students, okay? we will repeat the class in the future. We'll update the class in the future. So we hope to help many students as well. And uh, in the same time, please, uh, if you have any comments in the future, please continue to send the survey to me, okay? And then I will use that to improve our class. That will be, that will be very beneficial for all the, all the students in the academic community, okay? Okay, good. So that's all for the, Logistics, and uh, if there are no question about logistics, then let's get a let's start today's uh, lecture. Okay, if you have any question, feel free to ask me at any time. Okay. 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 Last time <clears throat> we discussed about the. Uh, I have a question, real quick, Doctor Tang. Please, please. Oh, sorry. So um, my internet connection has been a little bit spotty lately on campus uh, in my office. So yeah. I was wondering, are you still recording lectures so I can go back and see if in case I missed anything? Yeah, we, we actually, all the lectures should be recorded. So even this one you see is recorded. Okay. I just, we, I just we, wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I was going to, I have a Aki national conference coming up mm -hmm. um, that week of the invited lectures. So those will also be recorded as well, I'm, I'm assuming. Invited lecture, right? Invited lecture. Yeah. yeah. So invited lecture, we need to ask the invited speaker for permission first. Some of them okay. may, may not be comfortable because they want to protect their students, their work. That is completely understood. So I will ask both the speakers, see whether they, they are willing to record their lecture. Okay. If not, in case if not, then you can talk to the classmates who attended the lecture. They, they can take uh, they can take the notes and then update to you the content of the lecture. Okay. Can you hear me? Jackson, can you hear me? Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Anytime. Oh, we can we, oh, yeah, sorry, my internet connection's That's disconnecting fine. again, but thank you. Yeah, sure. We can always figure out the other way to to uh re invite. Reinvite those uh, speakers. Okay, so that don't don't worry about this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Anytime.
<clears throat> let's be very flexible, okay? The most important thing is that you guys uh, learn well in my class. And then this the class content uh, can enhance your research, enhance your future career. That's most important, okay? Good. Okay, any other questions regarding to the logistics? If no other question, we will start uh, today's uh, scientific materials. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So last time we discussed about the fax method. We discussed uh, some applications, some examples of fax method, right? So we, we know what is the basic experimental configuration now. And then we also explained the relationship between the relationship that uh, between multiple parameters in those uh, recorded data, right? The, the, the those parameters, including the fluctuation of the of the data, the mean value of the data, right? And then the variance of the data, right? So this, uh, and we also discussed about uh, the this scenario, this scenario, this uh, beads or particles within a light cone. In this experiment setup, they actually follow a uh, Poisson distribution, right? And also we connected uh, the different uh, statistical distribution together in different uh, conditions. And then further, with this uh, setup, we can also measure the diffusion coefficient of uh, chemical molecules, right? And then that uh, method, uh, using that uh, calculation, we can know the, we can, we can measure diffusion coefficient as well as uh, the separation time between the spikes when the particles move in a, when the particles available in those uh, solution are in a, in a low concentration, in a diluted concentration, right? So such as one millimole, one millimole is quite low, not very low, but it is quite low, okay? And then we can do that. And, th but, and then if we let this uh, concentration to be even lower, like one picomole, or even lower than one picomole, then it can be, it can be, uh, can you can reach the condition that at each time, at each time, there's only one particle get into the light cone, or there is no light particle, no no particle in the light light cone, right? So that is very very diluted, even less than one picomole, right? So all those conditions uh, can be can can be described. Uh, using the Poisson distribution, right? And uh, we discussed about uh, how to better use those uh, uh, acquired fluctuation data. <clears throat> what other information about that chemical can we get based on this uh, intensity fluctuation results, right? So we, in here, in this, uh, in, uh, in my slides, I talk about the two different uh, analysis methods. But there are other methods also available. We just don't have time to cover that in our limited lecture numbers. Okay, so you can I, I can give you the new other other references if you have interest. Okay, so now get back to the two methods we talked about. One is analyze the single trace, single trace time separation. Second one is doing the correlation of of the same trace time temporal correlation. That we will not discuss too much in the class. That I have a detailed explanation in the homework. So you can use the homework to practice that. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> so for, for the first method, analyze the single trace, the, uh, the time separation. That actually will need, will, that actually, this method actually is built upon the mathematic, mathematic derivation of Poisson, uh, Poisson distribution, okay? So that is because Poisson distribution also uh, can, can contain an, another mathematic factor inside it. That factor is dealing with the temporal gap, temporal, uh, the separation time, it's called a separation time, sometimes also called the gap, time gap between adjacent event during stochastic process. So if you look at the the, the time different time, time gap time gap between the adjacent 
any two adjacent event during the stochastic process, you can collect all those data and then plot those data, plot the event of those uh, time, plot the event of those uh, uh, the of the magnitude of the time. Okay, as a function event occurrence of those uh, magnitude as a function of the magnitude, then you will find this is the Poisson distributions equation. And then if you plot that, plot the, the histogram of the of the magnitude of the time gap, then you will find that the distribution follow a single exponential trace, single ex exponential trace. That is uh, that means as the for the random distribution, the smallest the gap, smallest the time gap between two adjacent events is has the highest probability. As the as the and if you look at those trees, more uh, you you look at the trees and then you you seek for the for the time separation with a, with a larger magnitude. You will find that it's harder and harder to find those uh, large magnitude because when the magnitude becomes larger, their probability, their occurrence probability go exponentially down. Okay, so in this experiment, particular example, when you go to when at one at the time zero or close to zero, there are many many occurrence for thousand right for thousand, and then if you go to the point two point oh two millisecond, then you will find it's less than one thousand. 0.02, only 0.02 milliseconds. Okay, so that's very, very short, short time, right? This is 20 microseconds. So this is a very short time, very small change. Then the, the occurrence goes uh, goes dramatically down. And then if you go even further or even even down, okay? The important thing is uh, <clears throat> they follow a single exponential curve. So this curve can be fit. If you, if you have a large data set, large data set that uh, you uh, like this, uh, this uh, spike trace, you can use MATLAB to quickly find out, to quickly collect all the gap here, and then join the plot, join the plot. And then you can fit this curve. You will find that the best fitting is following the single exponential. And then that best fitting gives us another important result, that is lambda, okay? We talked about the lambda last time. Lambda is actually the, the mu divided by t. Mu is the, in the Poisson distribution is the average event, right? Average event. And the average event divided by time duration is the average rate of that event, okay? So by doing this uh, fitting, you will get the average rate. That is very useful. In the, for, for the chemical, average rate is uh, giving us how many particles, how many molecules enter that light cone per time, per time right? Average, right? So <clears throat> this, uh, this uh, curve, is actually mathematically derived. I put it in these slides. We don't we don't have to spend the time to derive in a class, but you can use you can you can read this. This is very very smart. Okay, so they people use the Poisson distribution as a fundamental first order first the first order principle, and then use that to derive derive the probability distribution between this separation time, and then they, they derive this equation right derive this equation contains the lambda. Okay, now <clears throat> from here. We can go back to one question. We one example question we provided in the previous lecture. Now we can understand better. So in this question, it it, it actually demonstrate a unique, a useful application that help us to derive the concentration of the particle in the solution based on that fluctuation. Okay. Now in that in that experiment, if we can use in, in that uh, in that experiment. First, we can do the calibration. We can have uh, one molecule. We can let the the solution to be very very diluted. Do you guys see my mouse? Do you see my cursor here? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because I want to use the cursor to guide you to look at what we should uh, we should pay attention in on these slides. Good. Okay. So, if firstly before the experiment before the real experiment. People want to dilute the solution to be very, very dilute, very, very fast. Then they turn on the microscope, let the light go through the sandwich glass slides. And then the and then fill in 
the diluted chemical solution. That solution is so diluted, so that whenever you look at the look at the the microscope, you will see only one particle get into this light cone. So in the in the microscope, you will see one spike. You will never, very rare, you will get two molecules get in because it's very very diluted. Okay, so only one. And then if that that guy that molecule go out of the light cone, there could be some gap, gap time that you do not see any molecule inside. Okay, but that gap time, what I'm talking about is also very short. It's not a long time. It's not a several seconds. It's actually in terms of milliseconds to microseconds. So use a high speed camera, you can capture that. That is, that is, uh, um, that is uh, high. The speed is high enough to separate that a microsecond to nanosecond difference throughout the throughout the process. So when you have only one molecule getting in, based on the parameter parameters of the light pole and the no coefficient. Uh, diffusion coefficient of that molecule, that specific molecule. That molecule is uh, uh, we 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 can use that uh, for the for the <clears throat> for the calibration. Yeah, based on that, and then we know the diffusion equation, right? We know how what what's the what's the um what's the diffusion distance travel distance, and we know the we know use that we can calculate the time, right? Then we can calculate the the time that uh, within time duration that uh, within which that uh, this molecule single molecule is in a light form so here for this example this is a rhodomy this is a rhodomy molecule then we can calculate the time is uh, as a fraction of uh, millisecond 10 to minus four second right millisecond is 10 to minus three so it's a one tenth about one tenth of uh, milliseconds now this is single molecule okay single molecule then from here from this data then we can also cut from here this is the time, okay? Now from here, you, we can calculate, we can use this data to derive or to infer, to infer the, infer the time separation, infer the time separation for a different, for a different concentration of the same molecule. Okay, you can come, you can infer that. Or equivalent, you can infer if you have another concentration of molecule, you measure, you measure the separation time there. You can infer what is the new concentration. Usually that new concentration is higher because this is very diluted. The higher concentration, like here, what I said here, one picomole. If you have a, another concentration that is one picomole to be determined, then you put the concentration of the liquid here, you measure the separation time there. Then you can infer what is the exact number of that picomole, 1.1 or 1.2 picomole. You can find that out. Yeah. So that is a, that becomes possible because we derived the equation before. We, we find out the lambda. We find out that the, the separation time has uh, has to follow that single exponential decay relationship. Okay. Then the, every piece become together can be put together to be a coherent theory. Coherent, coherent, and uh, that it can guide uh, experiments. Okay. Now, just keep in mind that this is one molecule. This is one molecule. <clears throat> now, if we have uh, now, if you go back to that uh, that uh, single exponential principle we just talked about, then we can we can use that because that is the probability distribution, single exponential decay, right? Probability distribution. Then and it contains the time. Then use that. We can do the integration, probability distribution, or probability density distribution, right? And then we can use that uh, multiply with the time and do the integration of the d time and then take the integral from zero to infinity because time cannot be negative. So then from here, that's the counter all the possible choice of the separation time, tau, okay? Tau is the separation time. And then we can calculate the average time, right? Now, this is the fundamental calculation. Then we can calculate the, the tau. Now, because we have this analytical solution, then you get in, do the integration on the paper, and then you, you calculate that you find it's one minus lambda. So this lambda, what is lambda? Lambda is what we just talked about. The, the rate, the rate of the molecule get into the into the light cone, right? That in, that give the gives us the information about the concentration 
of the, the solution here, right? Now, this is a very important, uh, very important uh, um, equation. Now from here, from here, we can make the links now. Previous one, <clears throat> previous one, that, uh, that in this case, previous one, in this case, we have uh, only one molecule, then you have uh, one separation time, one molecule. That, that uh, at that uh, concentration, it is related to the separation time. If the molecule increase, that molecule increase molecule condition, different concentration molecule concentra uh, condition, also related to a different different separation time. Right? So they are linearly linked with each other, proportional to each other. And this since this is the same kind of material, same kind of uh, molecules there, then we can, if we know in one condition, one, one molecule case, one condition, then we can measure the separation time based on the measurement for another another concentration, same molecule. And then use the proportional, proportional and together. Then from we can calculate the the concentration of another concentration of that second condition. Right. In this case, I'm not calculating the concentration. The calculated time is the same thing. The same thing here. What is no is the concentration is no. And then you can you can put a concentration in um, uh, proportional to the to this this one molecule case. And then you find out the mean value here. But if you have a mean mean, mean value of the time, but you have the mean value of time measured by the experiment, you can also infer the concentration. So that's the same thing, that same, same, uh, same equivalent calculation, okay? So that's why this method is very useful. So you, once the once the once all the parameter is calibrated, then you can put that chemical, same chemical in different uh, concentration, concentration you can put it in and then write a MATLAB script to calculate, automatically calculate the to be determined the concentration for you. Okay. So this is actually really useful. You, and it's a very simple experiment setup. You just need to use a photo diet to measure those spikes. And then you can derive you 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 take advantage of the stochastic process, it's a mathematical foundation. Then you can calculate the chemical properties of those samples. Right. Here I only talk about the concentration, but there are other, there are more sophisticated calculation can also be involved to calculate the other properties of those molecules. Okay. I don't have time to talk about them here, but here, but, but in our class, I want to give you a give you a open a window. So then you know that this is the logic. This is the logics people can follow to to measure the to, to use by physical principle or mathematical principles to, to understand that by chemical properties or in the future biological properties of the molecule or molecule of the cell better, okay, more quantitatively, okay, get more insights. Okay. So this is the method number one, use the single trace analysis, analyze the single trace. Method two, method two is uh, analyzing the same trace, but same trace, but at a different time point and then correlate this different time point of the different time duration of the trace to find the information. So here is the, do you guys hear me? Do you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep, we hear you. Yeah. So good, very good, thank you, thank you. So here is the basic explanation of the second method. I actually have the have this slides in the homework, so you can read the homework. I will not go very detailed into the well, I will not go get into this uh, method now. It's a uh, very, very interesting. So you you can you can you can read these slides to perform your homework. I also provide this. I also give you some um some the equation, right? The, the, the function of the MATLAB in the homework, the convolution co correlation function. There. So you can use that to follow follow this uh, the those equations. So this is a g g tau square, g tau square. This is a correlation. You you see the t i i is the intensity i t times i t plus tau do the average that's the correlation okay and then you normalize correlation and then minus one get a net change net change of the correlation right from here when the tau changes from zero to infinity zero means uh, they are correlated with the self infinity means uh, they are completely forgetting they completely forgetting the history right 
and then you will get a different value. I mentioned here, you will get different value of G tau square. And then that is actually gives us this curve, this curve, you see my mouse, this curve. This is a, a typical correlation curve. From here, you can do, you can measure and the, the magnitude of this, magnitude of this, uh, this GT actually gives us uh, the concentration value. Okay, so here is some more derivation, some more derivation. And here you see, you if you if the letter tau equal to zero, G zero square, you actually get, when you do the correlation, you will self correlation. Okay, do the self correlation, you will get a one minus tau, one minus lambda, okay? One minus lambda, yeah. Yeah, Paul, you have a question? Paul. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, the diagram on the right showing the laser beam contour, I didn't really think about this until now, but we typically imagine laser beams to be a kind of a straight line or a column. So I was wondering why that one appeared to, I, for, I forget what that shape is called, where it, uh, it flares out on the top and bottom. Good question, good question. I haven't get a chance to talk about the optics yet. We have a, a lot of interesting optics, uh, optics material in the few ne in, in next uh, few lectures. Basically, what you are talking about is uh, is a good question. What you ask is a very good question. When you, this is the, you see my mouse? You see my mouse? Yes. So this is your sample plan. <clears throat> Basically in the, in, the, in the experiment, in the lab, when you use microscope, this is your sample plan. On the sample plan, if you look at the, look at the, the cells carefully, look at the, the point you focus carefully, the light microscope is constructed in a way that the light go light pass through the front face of the objective to focus on the focal point. So this point actually is the focal point. So light will generate a core to focus the light on that point. Okay. That is uh, a, okay. based on the objective, the objective and the microscope, the, the filters or the associated lens based on their, based on their um, alignment. Now in the lab, in the lab, you can also arrange that optics to make the light going out, not forming a core, not let the light focus on the focal point. You can get a light straight up like a, a ray, a, a parallel ray, okay? That's also fine. If you use, in, in our lab, if you, if you use the DMD, use a digital mirror, micro, uh, digital, micro digital, digital micro mirror, mi micro mirror devices, you can select the cells, optically select the cells there, and then you direct the light to expose those cells. In that case, you do not use focus. You actually reinsert another, another optics, another lens into the light path. You convert the parallel light into the focus beam, okay? And then, you, you, right. you, and then in that case, that is the parallel light going, parallel rays going out of the, optical uh, objective, okay? In this experiment, you don't want that. You want to focus it because you want the, because only the, the light coming out from this uh, narrow focused point, this is called a Gaussian wrist, Gaussian wrist, okay? So they only coming from this uh, concentrated point can excite those fluorescent uh, molecule. And then the, and then the, and then in the, op, in the, in the reverse way, only the light coming out, coming emitted by those uh, fluorescent uh, molecule will be collected by the opticals, optical objective, right? Because this light, the, the molecule here, when it emit light, emit light, it will go to everywhere, four pi. But only the, this, but the, our objective determines how, how many, how much light we can collect from this molecule, right? So this actually is the reason that you want in this experiment setup, you want the light to focus there, focus on this point, and then they collect those light out. If you use a vertical, a vertical ray, then you you will not be able to collect the light very efficiently. Right. Okay. Interesting. Good. Good. Yeah. Always ask those questions. There are many many things not that obvious. Like right? when when you look at the the those light rays in light rays in the 
in the lab, in the microscope, you may not know this is the focus there because it's so small compared to the naked eye. But if you zoom in, if you magnify the view there, you will find they actually form this kind of shape, the, 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 the focus light to the sample plant, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions so far? Any other questions? Okay. So <clears throat> based on this, then you, you can get, based on this curve, correlation curve, then you can get the concentration, right? You can get the concentration. Yeah. So then, then we are done with the second message. Okay. So to summarize it, the, the, this message is uh, very useful. Very useful. We talked about the, the setup, mathematical principles behind it and the, the, and the analysis approach, an, an analysis approaches of uh, this method, right? So this is a very useful method. Now, in practical, there are also some other factors we need to consider. You need to make sure that uh, the, those factors, in the, those cautions are really, really um, taken into account so that you can interpret those data care uh, correctly, okay? First one is, uh, <clears throat> what if the molecule we, we are studying, they, could, uh, they, they do not uh, emit out of the light uh, constantly. They, they, what if they are blinking like a star, like a star on the, uh, in, in the sky, right? They can blinking on and off. So sometimes they on, sometimes off. Then the spike we find here may not be because of uh, the, the molecule getting in and out of the light cone. It's because they are always in, but they are blinking there. This happens a lot. Many, many quantum dots can blink in on and off. They, they, and they, they emit out a very strong light. That is the unique properties of quantum dots, right? So if you get in and on and out, then we, we need to change the algorithm to analyze our data. Also, what if there is any flow? In sometimes when you, in sometimes if you don't, if people don't do experiment carefully, the glass slide may not be horizontal at all. So there's a, a there, there there's a tilt. Then due to the gravity, the flow will drive those molecules towards a certain direction. Then we are biased by the by by a potential field there, right? So then the, the data here, the fluctuation here cannot completely reflect the real concentration of the solution. And also the third one is if what what if the the fluorescent molecule here are heterogeneous. Then different molecule, they have different diffusion coefficient, different capital D, different. So then the results here is actually the combination of multiple types of fluctuation curves together. So now we need to do the, the data analysis to separate them. That is, that is easy to do. That is easy to do, not difficult. But we need to know whether this is true or not. Okay. If this is true, then we apply that. Uh, that data analysis algorithm to, to split different principal components. That is fine, okay? If we don't know that, then we will get, a, get, a, get a misleaded by those data, right? Do you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, very good. So here I list the three different, uh, three different points we need to, we need to uh, take into account. There are other points as well. When you do the experiment, there are many practical issues. So specific uh, condition requires specific uh, considerations, okay? So I'm happy to talk with you if you have uh, you encounter any questions, okay? Okay, that's all for this method. Now, <clears throat> now let's look at an even bigger picture. We talk about the diffusion equation. We derive the, those equation, and then we talk about the application of this equation. But if we look at the bigger picture, even bigger picture, not only re re uh, restricted us, in the diffusion. Then, if we look at this equation, we will find this, this kind of equation actually has a, this kind of equation, okay? The equation we derived, partial C, the concentration, temporal variation of uh, concentration equals to spatial, con spatial variation of the concentration, this equation. If we look at, look at this equation in a broader physics, we will find that they have uh, many analogies Analogies. There are many other in many other um, physical physics the topics they use a similar equation, but they are not studying the concentration. Okay. By the way, here this uh, 
Paul asked me before, right, about the about this uh, the meaning of this symbol. So I write it here. So this is the meaning. So in the, when you do the homework or the uh, or other calculation, then you can directly use that. It's a very very useful. Now I will talk about the several analogies. First analogy is, is in a quantum mechanics. This is my favorite uh, subject. Quantum mechanics is a we we actually previously used the quantum mechanics to determine determine the best protein we should use in the experiment. Because in the protein level, in the molecule level, you will need to use quantum mechanics mechanics to infer, to study, to explore the property of different molecules. And then use that we determine what's the best property, what's the best function we will need for the cell. Okay. Once we determine that protein's uh, um, best, we, we, once we determine the best protein's uh, so function, then we can back back derive the genetic uh, sequence that gave rise to that protein. Okay, so then based on that genetic sequence, we can put that DNA into the cell to let the cell express that protein. Okay, so this is actually our, our most favorite subject. Very very useful. I just don't have time to talk more more about this uh, in those lectures. You know, I can talk about this in the future. Yeah? But it, for the quantum mechanics, the core of the quantum mechanics is the Schrodinger equation. So this is the Dr. Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. If you write, look at the any quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics books or quantum physics books, you will find the Schrodinger equation here. Okay? So here, I, uh, H bar and the phi, phi is the wave equation. Okay? In the in the quantum quantum mechanics uh, field, uh, we are talking about uh, the probability. This is the wave, okay? The wave, the density of wave, give us the the probability. Okay? So Schrodinger equation is derived in uh, originally in terms of this. This equation contains three terms. Three terms on the right hand side. They actually the third term is a v times the wave function. This v is the external potential, external external potential field. If there are no external potential, then this V is zero. Then this one, this term vanished. Then we only have the first two terms. These two terms can be written in this way, can be written in this way. If you put, a, put the I, those guys back, it will become like this way. Okay? This term, I, I, this, this uh, term looks very similar to this term, right? Very similar, these two, very similar. So on the right, left hand side is also the wave function, the temporal change of wave function. Right hand side is a spatial variation of wave function. Right, it's very similar. If we put a d, put the d here, d equals to this term, then equal to this term, then these two equation actually identical. What does this mean? This means any mathematical trick, mathematical mathematical method you you people derive that in the engineering, in the engineering, okay? In the engineering field to solve diffusion equation. That, is, that mathematical method can also be used to solve Schrodinger equation in the physics domain, in the physics domain, okay? Or in the, in the quantitative biology domain, okay? So those methods, including Fourier expansion, separation of variable, perturbation theory, all those methods can be used to, to solve the diffusion equation can also be used to solve Schrodinger equation in the non-potential field. Okay, so that's one. Second one is uh, one, one analogy. Second analogy is in the heat transfer area. In the heat transfer area, if if when people study the propagation of the heat, they will find the, the especially in the solid, like in the in the metal, in the metal, metal is very good in the heat transfer. So they find that when they when, when they derive heat temperature, derive a temperature, temperature formula, they find that temperature formula follow this kind of uh, principle. So temperature, actually, capital T is temperature. Temperature, cap, um, temperature, temperature change also equals to K times the spatial change of uh, temperature. Okay, so K is the thermal diffusivity, thermal diffusivity, okay? Larger thermal diffusivity, better the, for the heat to transfer. And then when the heat transfer, it will change the temperature, right? 
So when you when you when you measure when you have uh, some heat source there, you will find that they will the the temperature induced by those heat follow this equation. Okay. And then, yeah, for the for the normal normal water, the diffusivity heat diffusivity has this value, normal water. For the gold gold, the heat diffusivity is a thousand times thousand times larger. Heat gold is very good in in conducting heat, right? So this is the value, and you can put it in. And the, this K equivalent to the capital D in the diffusion coefficient, right? This also means the mathematical tools used for the diffusion diffusion equation to solve the diffusion equation can also be applied to solve the temperature in the heat transfer area. Okay. Similarly, also in the fluid mechanics, when you study fluid mechanics, I will not have time to Right now it's 347 now. I don't have time to go very deeper about this. But if you look at the fluid mechanics book, you will find that when people study the in fluid mechanics, they always always people define the vorticity. This vorticity actually indicating when the fluid do the rotation, when the fluid do the rotation, then the velocity of the fluid can be can cross cross product with the gradient symbol, cross product. This is not dot product, cross product, okay? Use the right hand side, right hand principle to calculate that. Then you this uh, this uh, rotation can be described by the vorticity. And then this vorticity in the fluid mechanics for also follow this uh, same equation for match, right? And then this, uh, this equation, when people calculate the vorticity, they can use the similar mathematical method derived in the diffusion theory, derived from the diffusion uh, equation. Okay. So that's the that's the that's the uh, analogies we want to know. So we do not restrict ourselves in one particular topic of the biophysics. We want to make uh, make ourselves uh, to look at the bigger picture, whole landscape of the physics, biophysics. Okay. Now if we look at into this uh, diffusion equation Look back into this diffusion equation. Back, we will we when we when we solve this diffusion equation, we actually wanted to define correct boundary conditions in order to solve them correctly. And then to find the good boundary conditions, we also to we also need to define correct state of that diffusion scenario. So in in the in the when the, the chemicals diffuse. They actually have a important state that we need to we need to know. That is called a steady state. We actually always look at a steady state when they diffuse, and that state means uh, the the overall scene, overall movement, overall move, not a single particle. Overall, the movement of the the chemicals. Overall movement are not a is not a function of the time. They they are steady. They are they are steady in the in the in the in the in the uh, spatial domain, okay? But they are not in the equilibrium state because they are moving. They're moving, they have the specific uh, direction to go. Like we draw in the, when we derive the equation, we diffusion equation, we draw the spherical spherical domain there, right? So the, that, 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 that include, that include some, some source or sink inside that spherical domain so that they can attract they can attract the molecule to go into that if it's a sink, or they can emit out molecule to pass the spherical boundary if they, they are the source. Right? So they are sink and source. In this case, they are not in the equilibrium, not in the equilibrium. They have an active, active contribution to the whole, whole, um, whole field. But that contribution is not a function of time. So they, they provide a steady state, okay? So in this case, yeah, as I said here, they, 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 we have a collection of salts or sink or particle connected to a large reservoir. It is possible to, it is, it possibly will set up the concentration profile. That means they have a different, the C is a function of the, the space. C is a function of space. And then that is not everywhere uniform. It's not equal, equal everywhere. So then you have different gradient that makes the particle move. When the particle move, in the gradient, then they are not in the equilibrium, right? 
in this case, in this case, if they are not changing with the time, that means for the for the left part, left hand side of the equation, partial c partial t actually equal to zero. This term equal to zero. Okay. In this uh, particular steady state case, if equal to zero, then yeah, here actually you can think, what about the ion flux cross the membrane, and how that change the rest of potential? You can think about that. In the in the in the neurons, this in the neurons, if the C is the ion, if it's the C is the ion pass through the membrane, they can they can introduce a current to the membrane. And then that can trigger neurons to fight. Right? If the ion flux equal to zero is a, as a function of time equal to zero, then that will not affect the rest of potential. Then that neuron is not firing; it's in a rest of potential. They don't don't show changes of the the electrical dynamics. Okay? And then in general, if partial c partial t equal to zero, then on, only the only the right hand side value existing. That value is the is the uh, the delta square c. This term equal to zero. This one remember this one involves second order derivative of the concentration with respect to the x, y, z respectively. Right? Then this equation. Do you guys see my mouse? Do you see my mouse? Yep. Yeah. Yep. This yeah. equation. This equation no. is really unique. You don't see my mouse. Yeah, we can. We can. Okay. Okay. Good. This equation is a has a special name. It's called a harmonic function. Harmonic function. This function has a very unique property. For 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 this guy, for this equation, all its maximum value or minimum value always lie on the always a position on the boundary. They do not position on the center. You always position on the boundary. Okay. So it means. All the, the extreme when you plot this this uh, C as a profile, then the extreme point of this profile cannot uh, floating in the free space. Okay, so the constant means that all the uh, concentration maximum would diffuse away. If there is a concentration maximum within the within the free space, they always tend to go to the boundary. Would diffuse away. They go to the boundary. Okay, and uh, and if yeah, so this actually two different. Uh, Point. If there is a concentration maximum within the free space, they always diffuse away. They will not stay in that in there. If there is a concentration minimum in the free space, it will quickly be filled in. Then it will not become concentration minimum anymore. Okay. And also the the here remember here in this equation we don't have a diffusion coefficient anymore, right? Capital D to, uh, is vanished because the, this one is zero. So Know, know that value now. So if that, that implies implies this diffusion coefficient only determines how the how long it takes for the molecule to achieve a steady uh, steady state. Once the steady state is achieved, it uh, doesn't matter anymore. Okay, and uh, and also the this d does not uh, in does not influence what kind of steady state it can be formed. It does not match. That is only determined by this particular harmonic equation. Okay. Here is uh, some simulation results showing that if uh, this harmonic uh, harmonic function applies uh, to those conditions, you will find the maximum value and the minimum value. For this case, you see the the in the center you have a hole that is the boundary. Boundary is in the center here. Outside outside also has a boundary. So this is a this is a, a annulus, right? Annular ring, the ring hollow hollow circle there. Only all the C is within the between the outer outer surface and the inner surface. So all the mid, if this concentration reaches steady state, then all the maximum and the minimum value is are either on the outer surface or inner surface. So they form this kind of shape. They they form this kind of distribution. This is for the, the chemical concentration. But in reality, in the life, you also you, you actually see this all the time. When you when we are young, we play the um, soap bubble, right? You have a you can you can blow the soap liquid and then form the soap bubble. Those soap bubble, when you 
we always hold a, a, a metal ring, metal ring to, to hold the soap, soap bubble. And then soap bubble form a shape on the on the uh, on the metal 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 uh, ring. Is that right? That soap bubble, when they are under the gravity, the shape, the profile shape of the soap bubble actually also satisfy a harmonic function. So then they are maximal and minimal value always on the metal rings, okay, on the boundaries. Yeah, and this equation actually is, a, uh, and those, those, this equation, so you can also extend it, not necessarily equal to zero, because it, it can equal to a non-zero constant. Then this equation can be expanded to another analogy, another analogy, okay, in the electricity and magnet, magnetism field. That is the Poisson equation, called the Poisson equation in the electrostatics. So that tells us the voltage, voltage of uh, uh, electrical field distribution as a function of the charge uh, within the within the space. Okay. okay. Right now it's a three fifty seven. Now we have to stop. Yeah. Time flies. Time is very limited for our class, right? So we will stop here, and uh, um, we will listen to your presentation.